Okay, so got the recording started. Um, so welcome to the 2021-2022 Humankind series, uh, our first event of the series. I'm so excited to introduce West Shore Community College's Cultural Arts and Lecture Series. If you've been with us before, you might remember that in the last four years, we focused on countries or regions of the world, but this year we're focusing on a theme, movement. Tonight's presentation on Eber Ward will focus on how he created movement through transportation systems like railroads and shipping channels. Next week, we'll speak with four local experts about how people with disabilities move through a world that wasn't created for them. Later in the semester, we'll enjoy Claire Ashley's vibrant moving sculptures, learn about rural social mobility, and explore the social movement of diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we question and learn together this semester, I hope you'll consider how movement affects your life. Maybe you've moved from one town to another for a job, or you like to dance, or you're interested in how the movement of water creates hydroelectric power and how that power moves to our houses and makes things go. I could go on with examples all night long, uh, but movement is all around us. So our speaker tonight is Mike Nagel, professor of history and political science and chair of the social science division here at West Shore. He's the author of Justice S. Stearns, Michigan Pine King and Kentucky Coal Baron, 1845 to 1933, which was published by Wayne State University Press. He's currently working with the same press to publish a biography of E.B. Ward, which he hopes will be available sometime in 2022. This presentation will be based on some of his research for that manuscript. So thank you so much for being here, Professor Nagel. Well, thank you, Renee. I really appreciate you facilitating this. And um, uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk about some of the research that I've done and, and just to share the story of, of Eber Brock Ward. So I did want to start with some thank yous. Um, I want to thank, first of all, you know, Renee and many of my colleagues at West Shore who um, uh, hear uh, fun facts, uh, really interesting facts, or maybe some uh, nerdy ones, as we were talking about earlier uh, about Eber Ward a lot. But I also have to really thank um, uh, the, the college overall and particularly the Board of Trustees. Um, a lot of the reason why I was able to complete much of this research is because of a sabbatical award that I was granted for the fall of 2018, uh, the 2018 fall semester. And so I wanna thank the Board of Trustees and in particular, um, uh, Scott Ward, President Ward has been very supportive of sabbaticals. And so I really appreciate the support that the institution has provided for me um, in this year and in all of my years here at West Shore. Um, and I am lucky, uh, you know, uh, just last week I was able to sign a contract with Wayne State University Press. Uh, and we believe that the book should be able to come out, this a biography of Eber Ward uh, should be able to come out uh, by next year um, about this time in September of 2022. So um, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed uh, that we can make sure to, to do that. So, um, there's, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, how, sh how should we approach a uh, biography of someone like this? Um, the image that we see here is a famous painting of Eber Ward uh, by Stanley. And it's a, it's a huge, well, what it, what it shows here is that Eber Ward kind of at the, the peak of his uh, power and his influence. And he's this huge figure that's that's hovering over or that dominates uh, kind of the Michigan, uh, the area of Michigan. And just as he was the dominant figure of that era when he lived in particular the years immediately before and after the Civil War, um, he's the dominant figure here in this painting. Uh, the painting's 12 feet tall and five feet wide. And it's at the Detroit uh, Historical Museum. Uh, and and it's, I've seen it and it's, it's, it's really, really pretty cool. So uh, some contemporaries described Ward. Okay. One person described him as a man who was mild and agreeable with, uh, with his manners. He was open-hearted and he was very generous. He was also philanthropic. Another, his cousin, described him as a selfish man who was largely devoid of conscience. Of a conscience, he was tyrannical and envious, uh, and he often engaged in illegitimate and dishonest schemes. So, what I want to kind of do is I want to show some of the ways in which both of these statements about Eber Ward were true. Um, and because in some ways he was mild and agreeable and philanthropic. In other ways, he was tyrannical and he was involved in a range of schemes. I also am hoping uh, this evening uh, to be able to talk about how uh, Eber Ward's activities um, are, can be linked to the theme for this semester, 
uh, or this year uh, of movement. Um, and as I go along too, um, I'm also, I, I'd like to just share a little bit, especially for some of the students who may be involved. I, I wanna talk about research and how, yes, it's a lot of work to, to write a book. Um, uh, it's tremendous. It's, it's taken me six years so far. Uh, next year, it'll be seven uh, when the book comes out. But there's also some really cool things uh, that you can do uh, with history writing and so um, and that you can do when you're, you're doing some of the research. And so I'd like to talk about that as well. So uh, as we explore the life of Eber Ward, um, I would like to focus uh, and show how there are some key individuals that shaped his life, just as for many of us, we have key people who shape our lives. Well, um, uh, Eber's uncle Samuel, uh, shown on the left, uh, was someone who shaped his life, his closest confidant, uh, and um, uh, throughout his entire life was his sister, Emily Ward. And then on the right, uh, we see a drawing of Eber Ward's father, uh, Eber Ward Sr., uh, who also shaped his life. And what we're gonna see is that um, his father uh, influenced a lot of his ideas dealing with politics. So, um, if we just kind of start with just a little bit of uh, Eber's background, um, Eber Ward's parents were actually from the New England area, from Vermont. Uh, they met there. And then uh, Eber Ward Sr. was not very interested in being a farmer. And so he traveled around a lot. Uh, and, and his closest, like his closest business partner at times uh, was his, his brother, Samuel, uh, who we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, Sally uh, Ward um, I had a, or her father, or I say that actually her grandfather was actually a sailor. Uh, and so I wonder if maybe some of the um, maritime interest that Eber had uh, was inherited uh, from his mother's side of the family. Eber Award was the second of four children, and he was quite a Christmas uh, present for his parents when he was born December 25th uh, in uh, 1811. Uh, he was actually born in Canada. His parents moved around a lot, mostly in the United States, but some in Canada, and he was born near Toronto. Um, growing up, Eber's father spent time in Kentucky. And he wanted to move to Kentucky. And in fact, the family had plans to move to Kentucky. But one of the negatives associated with that time down in Kentucky was uh, Eber Sr. Um, uh, was exposed to slavery. And he was highly critical of slaveholders. He called them blasphemers and hypocrites because they owned other human beings. And so what we're going to see is that um, over the years, Eber will actually be influenced by his father's um, attitudes about slavery. And in fact, Eber uh, was a staunch opponent of slavery and a strong supporter of the Union during the Civil War. The family was actually traveling from, um, uh, from the North down to Kentucky uh, in 1817. They were gonna relocate down there when Sally Ward died suddenly. Um, it was a shock for Eber and his three siblings. Uh, the oldest sibling was Sally Ward, uh, or excuse me, uh, the oldest sibling was Emily. Uh, she was only nine years old, and she ended up having to assume a lot of the duties. She became a sister for her siblings uh, and also a, a mother uh, for them as, as, they, they, um, uh, as they grew older. The family eventually uh, relocated to Marine City. At the time, it was called Newport, Michigan, and this um, and eventually they relocated there in 1822. And the reason why they relocated there is because that's where Samuel Ward was living. He was Eber Ward Senior's brother, or Eber's um, Eber Eber Brock Ward, uh, the the person that I'm focusing on, uh, his uncle. Samuel Ward had engaged in the shipping industry for many years. Uh, he had first started off uh, during the War of 1812, uh, and Eber Sr. Uh, and Samuel were partners then. They did really well. Uh, and then Samuel Ward ended up settling in Marine City uh, in 1819. Um, and, uh, that's, uh, and Eber Sr. decided to bring his young children uh, to, uh, to live with, uh, with Samuel Ward, uh, because they, he wanted them to be around family. Now, you may or may not be familiar with Marine City. Uh, here's a map uh, of, of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, and the arrow is pointing to Marine City uh, over here. Um, and so 
Green City was an, ended up becoming an important uh, community for shipbuilding uh, and shipping. And um, Samuel Ward was responsible for a lot of that. Samuel continued his involvement in the shipping industry. Uh, and eventually he became the first uh, to lead a vessel, a, a vessel from the Great Lakes through the Erie Canal and all the way loaded with, with all sorts of uh, goods, uh, all the way to New York. So I wanna show a map here. So um, the arrow here is pointing to the Erie Canal. This was completed in 1825 and it connected the, um, uh, uh, the Hudson River uh, with, with um, the city of New York, but you could take a vessel from New York City all the way up the Hudson River through the Erie Canal, which was about 360 miles long, took about eight years to complete it. And then you could go from Buffalo all the way through the Great Lakes. This was a huge change for the U.S. economy, uh, and particularly for people living in states like, or territories and then states like Michigan, Ohio, um, Wisconsin, Illinois. It allowed the Midwest to become the breadbasket of the United States because most of the US population was along the Atlantic coast and um, they needed foodstuffs. And so the, the food that was, um, or the, the grains uh, and all, all sorts of food that was produced in the Midwest could be easily shipped to those huge uh, uh, Eastern markets uh, that were along the East Coast. Uh, and so the Erie Canal is really something that, in its completion is something that's um, hard to overestimate. Uh, and so uh, Samuel was the first to go from the Great Lakes uh, through the Erie Canal with a, all sorts of, of goods. Uh, he he um, uh, brought them to New York City uh, and then he had a, a bunch of goods that he was able to take from New York back through the Great Lakes. After that time, Samuel continued to expand his overall shipping empire. Uh, he had more ships uh, and Eber was involved with this uh, really from a young age. Uh, beginning about the age of 11, Eber served as a cabin boy, uh, just kind of like doing a range of odd jobs. Sometimes he was on, on the vessels, you know, beginning about the age of 11. And then maybe for a couple of years, maybe he wouldn't be there, but he was kind of on and off uh, working uh, along the side in a way uh, for his uncle, Samuel. Um, growing up was actually pretty difficult for the Ward children. I say this because their dad had actually been absent for times when they were growing up. And then they made this trip down to Kentucky and their mom had died. Uh, and their father uh, continued in the shipping industry himself, which meant that he was gone for long stretches of the time. And the children often would end up uh, were living with family members or family friends. And it was really a difficult time for them. Uh, and I had mentioned this a little bit before, but Emily had a lot of pressure on her because she not only was a sibling and very young, but she had to assume some of the roles that her mother had, uh, had um, uh, after her mother's death. When Eber and Emily reached their teen years, they were the two oldest, they eventually moved to New York and they worked there for a while. Um, each of them had a, um, uh, each of them had a trade. Eber started off in the varnishing trade. And you know, if you think of varnishing at that time, it's a little bit different than today. It's kind of like construction. Um, uh, so if you go back to the Middle Ages, you know, it, it's, it was an important trade dealing with construction and painting, um, things like that. Today, they would have been involved with um, like plaster work and things like that. Eber did that for a short time, uh, but then uh, he was able to connect with someone uh, who had a store and he began clerking in the store. Emily, um, Emily was also able to get a, um, uh, was also able to get a, a position and that was as a milliner. Now you might say, what in the world is a milliner? Well, that's a person who makes and then sells hats. This was one of the rare occupations that was available to women in that era. Um, and you, you could be a seamstress, but also um, uh, even being a milliner was something that was, um, was maybe even a little bit more prestigious for women. Uh, Emily probably 
was um, appointed to a, a craftswoman uh, for a period of maybe three years. Maybe the first year, uh, she wouldn't get any money. Uh, she would have room and board, but she didn't really make much money. It, she was learning a trade. Uh, and so she had this apprenticeship um, that was actually working really well. And what we're going to see is that Emily ends up becoming someone who is an advisor to, to Eber. And she probably learned a lot of accounting things um, from this time period uh, when she was uh, in this apprenticeship um, as, um, uh, as a milliner. The two lived in New York for a few years until their dad received a new opportunity. In 1830, he began serving as the lighthouse keeper at Bois Blanc Island. Now, if you see it, you know, there on your uh, on the list, um, it's it appears as if it would be Bois Blanc Island. Um, my understanding is the proper pronunciation would be Bois Blanc with the French. It's um, white bark because there were lots of trees that had white bark. Um, and here we see the current lighthouse that's at Bois Blanc Island. Now, if you don't know where Bois Blanc Island is, uh, the arrow is pointing to it. It's very close to Mackinac Island in the Straits, and it's a little bit bigger than Mackinac Island. Uh, so that's where it's located. It's located in an important spot uh, strategically, like for trade and things like that. Um, and Eber would end up spending two years there with his father. Now, uh, I, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about some of the cool things that I was able to do as I was doing the, the research and writing for the book. My wife and I visited Bois Blanc Island this summer. It was awesome. Uh, it was really pretty cool. Um, so there are no paved roads on Bois Blanc Island. You can drive a car there, you know, in contrast to um, uh, Mackinac Island. Uh, but there's no paved roads, and all of the, the roads have the same speed limit. It's 25 miles an hour. It's very, very rustic and isolated. There are uh, maybe only a few hundred people who live there year-round. It picks up during the summer, but it is a gorgeous island. And I would encourage people um, who have the opportunity to go uh, to visit the island. If you want a rustic experience, oh, gosh, it's wonderful. Well, Eber ended up spending two years there with his father uh, as his assistant. But what his father realized is that as Eber was growing physically, uh, he was not being challenged mentally. And so after two years, he, he left the island and he became his uncle's protege. It was right on the eve of Eber's 21st birthday that he began working for his uncle Samuel full time. Uh, as I say here, uh, uh, the, he, went, he ends up starting as a protege, but eventually emerges as his uncle's partner. Uh, the apprenticeship really did him well. Eber did not have a lot of formal schooling. He never went to college, but this was an additional apprenticeship, so to speak, uh, where he was forced to learn all sorts of things. He clerked for his uncle at their, um, that their stores where they, where they sold items at, like in the warehouse. He, he um, managed a lot of the vessels. He also began to captain some of the ships. Initially, he served as a, as a first mate, uh, as a mate, and then a first mate. And then he um, ended up captaining some of the vessels. At one point, the General Harrison was the leading vessel in Samuel Ward's fleet. Well, Eber, uh, uh, and, and by the mid 1830s, uh, purchased a piece of the ship, and that's when he became started to become his uncle's partner, as opposed to simply his protege. Um, whoops, I'll go here. I just went there. Uh, now, I'd like to offer a little bit of context. How is it that this is important? What's going on in Michigan uh, at this time? Samuel started this shipping empire at an important time. It was very strategic because Michigan was just about to experience a huge population explosion. Michigan was a territory until 1837 when it became a state. The map that's shown here on the right, the blue areas identifies you know, the, the current uh, um, territory of, of Michigan. Well, Michigan, or the current state of Michigan, the red includes the initial territory uh, that was called Michigan. Uh, but when Michigan became a state in 1837, uh, the, the red portion of that map um, became Wisconsin territory. 
But you can see those figures on the left. In 1820, there were just under 9,000 people, but that triples by 1830, and it grows exponentially by 1840. The people who were moving into Michigan, well, they needed transportation to get there, and Samuel Ward and his protege and partner Eber were only happy to bring people there. Additionally, once people moved there, they needed all sorts of supplies. If they were going to establish a farm, they needed uh, plows and they needed um, uh, livestock, they needed seed, they needed food, they needed um, lots of different things. And again, um, Eber and his uncle were only happy uh, to provide those things. Uh, and then once those goods were produced, uh, they were shipped out of uh, Michigan and, and other areas of the Great Lakes uh, to Eastern markets. And the vessels that were owned and operated by Eber and his uncle um, uh, transported them. And so uh, they did very well financially. Initially, all of Samuel's vessels were schooners. They operated under sail. The very first steamboat that Samuel Ward uh, uh, built uh, and owned um, is shown here. Uh, this was the Huron, and this was from 18, it, they, they, um, uh, it was launched in 1839. It's possible that Eber uh, convinced his uncle that they needed to switch from schooners to steamboats because they were getting more and more competition. Um, and Eger, what we will see is that Eber becomes the more aggressive of the two partners. He was younger. Um, he was willing to take more risks. Samuel, over the years, particularly uh, by the 18, mid 1840s or so, um, he started to, to distance himself from some of the activities, and Eber took over more and more of the day to day operations. Um, what I what I you see here uh, would be the number of vessels that just um, you know exploded uh, in the fleet that Samuel and Eber owned jointly. Uh, beginning with the Huron, it was so successful, they had enough capital to build vessels, one a year. And then if you notice by 1849, um, there are two. Uh, 1851, there are three. So they were doing incredibly well uh, financially um, uh, in, in this, um, uh, you know, uh, as they were in, in the shipping industry in there. Here we see some images of some of those vessels. Um, I like the, the reindeer shown here on the right. And the reason for that is because not only is this kind of a neat uh, image of, of a vessel, uh, but you also see on the right uh, where it says E.B. Ward's Warehouse. And so uh, not only were they engaged in shipping or do I dare say movement of people uh, and goods uh, throughout the Great Lakes, but he had this warehouse of all sorts of items that they thought that the settlers would need uh, out in the pioneer areas uh, of the Great Lakes. Uh, and so uh, you see that here. Uh, the Pearl is another vessel that I'll talk about a little bit later that was actually involved in the Underground Railroad at times. Um, and here on the bottom left is a luxury liner, I guess you could say, kind of like that. It, this was kind of the epitome of uh, one of the, the of luxury uh, for some of the vessels that um, Eber and his uncle owned. There were others who had large fleets, but the Atlantic was one that was um, uh, very passenger friendly, so to speak. The Atlantic, well, over the years, Eber and Samuel had a really good safety record, hardly any accidents. However, in 1852, the Atlantic was um, collided with another vessel called the Ogdensburg, and it led to a disaster. It was horrible. Um, it happened late at night when everyone was sleeping. There were uh, numerous um, immigrants who were on board the ship. And when the, the, um, the vessels collided, there was tremendous confusion. And a lot of people didn't speak English, and it was just awful. Um, the captain of the Atlantic uh, realized that they were in danger. And so right after the collision, uh, he tried to sped, uh, he sped toward um, land. Um, but as the, the vessel took on water, um, the engines died and they were dead in the water. Eventually, 
about 250 people died. This was one of the worst disasters on the Great Lakes. Um, and Eber Ward was angry uh, at what had happened. And he believed that the other vessel uh, was at fault. But then many of the survivors of the, this Atlantic disaster uh, blamed him. Um, there were a range of um, stools like tin, tin stools uh, and, and other um, uh, seats and, and chairs and things like that on the vessel, some of which were designed to be flotation devices. A lot of people were confused. They grabbed some of these, they jumped in the water and they were not flotation devices and they drowned. Um, Eber, well, yeah, so um, it, it, was, it was just awful. Um, and Eber got into kind of a, do I dare say, shouting match. Um, uh, there were a range of um, uh, newspaper articles and editorials that went back and forth. And at times Eber began to blame the victim uh, for choosing the wrong type of item in order to try to save themselves. It was really, really just an awful um, uh, incident. Uh, eventually, the Ogdensburg and the Atlantic were both considered to be at fault, uh, but it was just a horrible, horrible uh, disaster. One other thing that I'd like to do is I, I, want, I would like to, at times, talk about Eber's business activities, uh, as well as his private life. Um, and because Eber eventually would become the wealthiest man in, in Michigan, uh, but, but I want to talk about his, you know, both his business activities as well as his private life. Eber got married in 1837, and he and his wife are shown here. Um, his wife's name was Polly. She was actually Samuel Ward's niece. She was a blood relation to Samuel's wife. Okay. So, uh, it, she was not blood related to Eber. Um, however, she was, the, the two in a way were kind of, were related. Um, some question Eber's marriage because Samuel had one son, but his son was considered to be mental. The, the phrase that was used was mentally incompetent. And so whomever married Samuel's niece would maybe have a shot of inheriting some of Samuel's money. Uh, and so uh, Eber was criticized by some by saying that he chose to marry Polly uh, because um, she was, because he stood to inherit some of this money. I suspect part of Eber's attraction to Polly was the fact that she was uh, his uncle's niece. Um, but the two did have a marriage that lasted over 30 years. They had eight children, seven survived uh, to adulthood. The image shown here, um, I think is really pretty cool. It was a photo taken uh, probably about five years after their marriage. It's, it's believed to be from 1842, and it's possibly the oldest daguerreotype that was produced in the state of Michigan. Here we see Eber sitting in a chair. He's dressed in a suit and tie. He's holding a book in his hand. Uh, while he's also um, in his other arms on the table. But next to him is the image of a steamboat. Here, he appears to be very confident. He's self-assured. He's prepared to overcome any obstacle that's placed in his path. Um, this was taken about the time that you know, they were expanding their fleet of steamboats. Eber's portrayed as a young, successful businessman proud of his accomplishments, and ready to overcome any obstacle. Uh, Polly is on the right. She is a young woman with great pride in her, um, uh, in her role as a mother. She's wearing a lace fichu with her hair pulled back. It's parted in the middle. And um, she's got a, a ring on her index finger. Uh, and she has a necklace drawn tightly around her neck. She's the epitome of true womanhood as a woman holding a child. This is probably their child, Henry, who was the only child who did not uh, survive infancy, died when he was one or two. Uh, so he died very young. Um, uh, and she's holding this sleeping baby very gently in her lap. Eber has that image of the steamboat. Um, Polly 
just has a plain black background. And so I think what we've got going on here is we've got a contrast based on gender uh, and representations in, the, in that era. I think it's a really cool uh, image. Well, by the 1840s and 1850s, Samuel and Eber are operating one of, if not the largest fleets of vessels on the Great Lakes. As and, you know, I had mentioned before that Eber was the more aggressive of the two. Uh, also, um, Samuel at times really suffered from some illnesses. And so as Samuel um, uh, had some ill health, Eber took over more and more of the business. At one point, um, Samuel said, hey, Eber, I want you to buy me out. But Eber wouldn't do it. I would argue, and the reason why I think that Eber said no to this is because Eber wanted to have as large a fleet of vessels as he could. Um, he really just wanted to, uh, to expand his empire. And if he had to give his uncle, buy his uncle out and give him half the cash, he wouldn't have had the capital to continue to grow uh, his fleet of vessels. Well, eventually Samuel died in 1854 and he left the bulk of his estate to Eber. This was much to the consternation of, um, uh, of Eber's um, uh, cousin, David. Uh, his cousin, David, was very angry at this. And he said, well, he was the one who, who, who said that, that Eber had married Polly for money uh, and that the only reason, that was the only reason why uh, he married her. Uh, one can understand why uh, 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 he was frustrated at Eber uh, for getting all of this because it was estimated that somewhere between three, the, the, the Eber, Samuel's uh, share of, of um, their, their um, holdings was somewhere between 300,000 and a million dollars. Uh, and that's in the 1854 dollars. Uh, that's a lot of money today, but it's even more back then. I was lucky enough to be able to do some research and to get access to ledger books that are that were at the, um, down in Detroit at the Detroit Public Library. And those ledger books provided a lot of detail. That's where I got the information about the uh, the vessels and that. And so in 1851, a couple of years, you know, a few years before Samuel's death, the two of them owned about 450. Their all of their vessels uh, were were valued at about $450,000 and, and all their other assets. A year later, it was $100,000 more at over $550,000. I thought I would kind of try to share one little thing here. Uh, if you notice, there's my thumb uh, on the one uh, uh, ledger book there as I'm trying to take an image. These ledger books are kind of like Excel sheets. Uh, and, and they just have all sorts of, of really cool information. Uh, and so this is where I was able to see that if you look at the title here, it's EV and Sam Ward's um, uh, properties owned on equal in a joint account. And so that's where I get the figure of the 450,000 in 1851 and the 555,000 in 1852. Now, you can go on the web and you can use some inflation calculators. And one of the one that I have used is from westegg.com. And the $555,000 in $2020 would equal about $17.5 million. So that gives you an idea as to what Eber actually um, uh, would have uh, inherited and why some other members of the family weren't necessarily so happy uh, with the fact that Eber ended up with this. I've talked a lot so far about movement uh, and transporting people and goods to the Great Lakes, to Michigan, uh, and then some of the goods that they produced back to Eastern markets. I want to continue this idea of movement uh, by talking about uh, another project or another area where Eber became interested. The Sioux locks uh, were completed in the 1850s, uh, and this was something that um, uh, Eber uh, Brock Ward was very strongly in support of. So the rapids along the St. Mary's River, kind of where that, that arrow uh, where the Sioux Locks is shown right here, had been a barrier to navigation into Lake Superior for decades. Going back to uh, the late 1700s, there was interest 
uh, in trying to develop some locks to try to facilitate the transportation uh, or, or the facilitate vessels being able to go into, um, uh, uh, into Lake Superior. Well, this became even um, a bigger issue uh, by the 1840s when copper was discovered in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Eber Ward became a champion in support of the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the canal. Uh, and in 1852, Congress passed a law granting about 750,000 acres of public land in the state of Michigan that could be sold in order to fund the Sioux Locks project. Uh, construction began in 1853. What's interesting is that um, uh, the, the plans for the locks were uh, to be 350 feet in length. Eber was ardently opposed to that. He said, that's way too long. We'll never get it finished on time and it'll cost too much money. Well, um, he, said, he said that they only need to be 260 feet long. And for his vessels, that, that would have been fine. Uh, but uh, he lost the fight, so to speak, on that. They did end up finishing it. And by the way, before too long, um, his vessels uh, were, long, uh, were much longer uh, and they benefited by the 350 foot, um, uh, uh, the 350 foot locks. You see on the left, some of the initial construction, which lasted two years. Once it was complete, it allowed Lake Superior's rich bed of iron ore to be transported to the nation's steel mills. At one point, the Sioux locks handled more shipping tonnage than the Suez or Panama canals. These days, millions of tons of cargo is transported throughout the Great Lakes through the locks. Uh, so here we see another example um, of movement uh, associated with the theme that we're addressing this year uh, with uh, humankind. In addition to being engaged in the, uh, uh, in the, the uh, shipping business, one of the things that's amazing about Eber Ward's activities is that he began to diversify his activities. He also was involved in the iron, the production of iron and steel. This began in 1853 when he founded the Eureka Iron Company. And it was located near Detroit in Wyandotte, Michigan. They produced a range of different items, uh, most importantly, iron rails, like for railroads. By 1860, it was the largest factory in the state and he was a huge employer. And by uh, 1866, he had over 400 employees and the, the monthly payroll was $20,000. So this was a huge, huge enterprise. But Eber didn't stop there with the production of iron and steel. He was a man of iron and steel, but he was so successful at Wyandotte. By 1857, he established another um, iron uh, um, facility uh, in Chicago. The initial investment was $225,000. Before long, it was a million. There were over 500 employees and those 500 employees uh, um, uh, supported uh, several thousand families and several other businesses. Uh, and one of the things that always characterized Ward's activities, particularly with the production of iron and steel, uh, was that he always invested in the most uh, important, uh, uh, in the most efficient um, items. Um, and the, he always wanted to use the best technology. And if they started building something and they, there was something new that had come out, he was willing to scrap what they had, start from scratch, because he knew that in the long run, that would be a better investment. Um, not only did he have the facility uh, in Wyandotte in Chicago, but he also founded one in Milwaukee. Uh, and on the bottom right, you see the rolling mills at Bayview. Bayview was like a, a neighborhood community uh, to Milwaukee. Uh, and so I just kind of want to show this on the map. So the arrows here, the one on the, on the right, that's just a little bit to the south of Detroit. That's where Wyandotte was located. He was also in Chicago and he was in Milwaukee. So I most definitely would argue uh, that he was this man of steel 
uh, uh, who had a huge impact on the production, the, what, what would eventually be one of the key items uh, that, was, that was driving the US economy in the late 1800s. Possibly his greatest triumph, I had mentioned before, uh, that he always wanted to use the, the best technology. Well, there was this, uh, in England, uh, there was something called the Bessemer method that was used. And that was the, um, the, the British were uh, famous for their production of iron or, and, and steel. Well, Eber Ward was the first in the United States to produce steel using the Bessemer method. They did so at Wyandotte. They um, then took those uh, ingots and they brought them to Chicago and they, um, uh, and they um, created um, steel uh, rails for railroads. See, the railroad industry was one of the key items uh, of the US economy as well. Uh, you know, the transportation system and that uh, in, from the 1850s, 60s onward. Well, you needed the, to have rails in order for the trains to run. And so um, uh, iron rails would last maybe a couple of years. Steel rails using the Bessemer method would last 10, 12, 15 years, maybe even more in some cases. And so he wanted to use the, the Bessemer method and he was very successful in doing so. But here we see a little bit of a dark side of Eber Ward. He considered unions to be wrong and tyrannical, and this led to conflict at times. Uh, he consistently tried to um, uh, cut costs, and generally speaking, one of the greatest costs or largest costs uh, that owners or factory owners had was labor cost. Um, and so he wanted to keep the wages down. He also tried to control his employees' lives. Uh, and in the areas where he bought property and established company towns, alcohol was strictly prohibited. Uh, a per, if a person was found with alcohol, they could uh, immediately be fired. One thing that's interesting about um, Ward is that he never smoked, he never chewed, he never drank any alcohol. And he expected his employees to be sober and not hungover. Um, at some facilities, some steel facilities, the, the conditions were so hot and so difficult, uh, men would drink a uh, watered down beer uh, during, during their shift. Eber said no, he wouldn't allow for that at all. They would often drink oatmeal water with lemon in it in order to try to make sure that they could remain hydrated. Uh, and so his employees uh, often um, were frustrated with him because of that. And at times there were strikes uh, as uh, the employees sought improved conditions and higher wages and Eber ran his operations with an iron fist. Ward was involved in transportation, uh, or he was involved in, in shipping and shipbuilding. He also was involved in iron and steel production. And he even was the president of a railroad, the Flint and the Pierre Marquette Railroad. Uh, on the left, we see a map identifying the Flint and Pierre Marquette Railroad, which was founded in 1857 by Ward, um, and, um, uh, and he remained as president of the railroad until he died. This was a land grant railroad, one of several uh, in Michigan. So what happened is in order to help fund the railroad itself, um, the state of Michigan uh, for, would give land to the, the, um, the railroad company. So for every mile of track that was built, Ward's um, uh, Pier Mar Flint and Pier Marquette Rail Rail Railroad would receive six square miles of property. So for every mile that they built, they would receive six square miles. This was kind of a typical thing that happened in many different states because the um, construction of the railroad lines was so expensive. Well, once this, you know, uh, th it took a long time to complete this. So it started in the 1850s. It finally reached Ludington by 1874. But once this was done, you could see passengers as well as freight being transported across all of Michigan. Um, and this was quite an accomplishment. And it was a huge boon uh, for um, the Ludington area when it was completed in 1874. And if you read some of the um, uh, the newspaper articles, oh, the, the, the railroad's gonna be done um, very soon. And, and people were really excited about the economic development uh, that would be provided uh, for the area once it was complete. 
So what's kind of the, the secret to Eber Ward's success? Well, um, thus far, uh, what we see um, is, is he was engaged in these diverse industries, but he also was involved in, and he also uh, organized them in such a way that he took advantage of vertical integration because he owned property in the UP where there were iron mines. Then he owned vessels that took that iron ore and transported the iron ore to iron and steel mills. Well, he owned the iron and steel mills okay, where they produced, among other things, railroad rails. And then he sold those railroad rails to the railroads where he was the president and he was the largest stockholder. And so by using vertical integration, he was able to cut costs. He integrated all of these diverse uh, parts of his empire and he controlled it uh, with an iron fist. And you know his, his um, employees often would say, oh, I got this letter from, from Ward and he, he's asking all these questions. And he was very attuned to what was going on um, uh, in his businesses. Andrew Carnegie was very famous for doing similar types of things, but Eber Ward was doing it well before Andrew Carnegie. Uh, and so a lot of people are unaware of the activities that uh, Ward had, but people, most people are familiar with Andrew Carnegie. I like to go back to his family life here again. Eber and Emily were, had always been very close, the two oldest children. Um, Emily never married. Uh, eventually she was known by family members, but also members of the community as Aunt Emily. And Emily and Eber really had this unique relationship. I've read an awful lot of Eber's correspondence and his letters to Emily um, are much different in their tone uh, as compared to any others. Um, at one point he was writing to her and he apologized because he hadn't been corresponding with her much. Uh, and he said uh, something along the lines uh, here, you and I have, been, have lived together more than any other two of our family, have seen trials and troubles and prosperity together and enjoyed unlimited con uh, confidence of each other. As a wayward boy is inclined to neglect those to whom he is under the greatest obligations as he grows old, I have unwittingly neglected many of the social duties which belong to my situation. Basically, he wasn't keeping and uh, uh, you know maintaining his correspondence with his sister. Uh, she probably wrote him a letter saying, hey, I need to hear from you. Uh, and he apologized. Um, so the two of them continued to be very close over the years. Uh, by the way, I never read anything like that in his correspondence to anybody else. The reason why Emily got this title of Aunt Emily is that she helped to raise her sister's children. So Eber and Emily had two other siblings. They had a sister named Sally. She died in 1847 after she had, she had had several children. She actually suffered from mental illness and she died in the New York Lunatic Asylum. A few years later, their other sister named Abba died um, after she gave birth to a child. Emily ended up raising those children uh, while Eber provided the money. The um, uh, Sally's children are shown in the image there on the left. Um, they had a daughter named Emily, Elizabeth, Francis, Florence, Mary, and Asa. This photo was probably taken shortly after uh, they came to live with Emily. And Asa, shown here, would end up fighting in the Civil War, and he died during the Civil War. Um, and so this is uh, the only image that I've ever seen of Asa. There might be another. I haven't seen it. Emily's long-held dream was to care for children, and she wanted to educate children. And so those dreams came true with the help of her brother who paid for things. Uh, when she opened an academy in Newport, which is now Marine City, uh, and she did so in 1845. Uh, this was designed to offer additional educational opportunities for people uh, and, and for children, I should say, uh, and um, it was at a cost of $3 per year. 
Um, just as Eber ran his businesses with an iron hand, the same was true for Emily, as one uh, neighbor put it. Aunt Emily had charge of the schoolmaster. She hired the teachers. She had charge of the schoolmaster, the schoolhouse, and the pupils. She was a board of education of one with original and appellate jurisdiction. Um, so she was in, in charge. One can only imagine Emily writing a note to Eber saying, hey, I need some new maps, or we need to expand the library for the kids, and Eber doling out the money. Eber was this hard-fisted, um, hard-driving business leader. Emily became his conscience in many ways, uh, and she encouraged him to expand his philanthropy, which really kind of began uh, with his activities and went with her academy and then would expand to some other areas uh, that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Hey, Mike, sorry to bother yes. you. I just yes, wanted to no point problem. out that, that we're um, getting close to eight. Wanted to make okay. sure you, thanks. Yep, okay. My goal was to try to finish like about a little bit after eight or something like that to keep it like to an hour and then have a Q&A. Perfect, I, I yeah. hope that that seems, okay. All Absolutely, right. thanks. So uh, Eber Ward um, was also interested in politics. Uh, initially, he was a Whig, but then he became a strong member of the Republican Party. And he was an ardent opponent of slavery. In the 1850s, he gave $10,000 to an anti-slavery cause, um, uh, uh, you know, just as even before the Civil War uh, had taken place. This continued with his vessels. One of his um, uh, employees described him as a radical on the question of slavery. Several of his vessels, in particular three, were linked to the Underground Railroad. The Pearl, which I showed a little bit earlier, and here's an advertisement for the Forest Queen, and then another called the May Queen. Um, his employees were informed that if any runaway slaves were to come, uh, that they were supposed to be allowed onto his vessel and they didn't have to pay anything. Here we see a map that identifies uh, the Underground Railroad. Uh, and you know this was not a, a literal railroad and it wasn't literally underground, but it was a series of safe houses. And Detroit became an important area on the Underground Railroad because of its proximity to, um, to Canada where slavery was illegal. It's been estimated that maybe between one and 10,000 people escaped to slave, uh, you know, uh, escaped slavery under the Underground Railroad uh, between the 1850s uh, and up to the Civil War. Um, once uh, in the 1850s, a slave catcher came to Michigan looking for a slave who had escaped. Well, that slave what, had been working as a, a, um, a chef on Ward's, one of Ward's steamers. Ward helped that that slave uh, um, get away from the slave catcher, uh, paid for his freedom, uh, and then eventually helped him uh, get the rest of his family freed uh, uh, from slavery. There was another time when um, Ward was on one of his ships uh, and there were some runaways who had showed up uh, and the slave catchers were right on their tail and the, they both ended up, the slaves, the runaway slaves and the slave catcher were on this, the vessel at the same time, but they were in kind of international waters. And so when Ward found out about this, um, uh, he had the vessel stop uh, and, and lowered a boat for the runaway slaves to be able to get away uh, and into Canada and the, for their freedom. He was very actively involved uh, in the movement of slaves from, areas of the United States to areas where slavery was illegal. In addition to this, he was involved in the, the um, shipping industry, iron and steel production, um, uh, railroads, and lumber. He influenced the community, the, uh, the city of Ludington and the development of Ludington. Well, in eight, by 1869, Eber Ward owned about 70,000 acres of heavily timbered property along the Pier Marquette River. He just had one problem. He needed a spot in order to uh, have a sawmill. Well, 
uh, James Luddington was the leading lumber baron in Luddington at the time, and he owned the property that Ward wanted. James Luddington refused to sell Ward the property. And in fact, I was able to, I was lucky enough to go to New York uh, and to get to the Luddington family papers. And Ludding, James Luddington wrote to his brother in New York and he described um, why he didn't want to uh, uh, sell this property to Luddington. He said, quote, there's more money in the Ward lands than in a California gold mine. My opinion is that if we could get them this property, we would own the finest lumbering property in America. So Ward had this outstanding lumber property, but he didn't have a site for a sawmill. Well, when James Luddington's employees possibly accidentally trespassed onto Ward's land, cut down some of his trees, Ward heard about it, but he waited, he didn't do anything. The next time James Luddington came to Detroit, Ward had Luddington arrested and thrown into a Detroit jail. James Luddington changed his mind and decided to sell Ward the property. Uh, eventually, Ward would become the region's largest lumber producer. And James Luddington suffered a, men a breakdown of some sort and had to retire after this. On the left, we see um, an image of Eber Ward's South Mill in Luddington. The, the, on the right, we see a map that identifies the city of Ludington in about 1880. And the North Mill is shown in the, the first one, the one a little bit you know, higher, I guess you could say. Uh, that's roughly where Pierpoint, well, it's where Pierpoint um, condos are today. And then the other one was the South Mill. Uh, it's kind of at the end of Washington Avenue, like where um, Oxychemical is today. For years, Eber Ward talked about the fact that money doesn't buy you happiness. Yet, he worked tirelessly to build a huge empire and to make as much money as he could. Possibly the best example of some of the excessive things that he spent money on would be his home, which is shown here, which was a huge mansion on Fort Street in Detroit, um, complete with an, uh, an iron fence to keep the riffraff out. Uh, eventually, Ward would succumb, as I say here, to the excesses of the Gilded Age in America. It also uh, led to some problems uh, with his family life. Um, one of his friends described his family life as very unsatisfactory. Uh, Eber and Polly had these, all these children, but he sometimes was engaged in affairs, and he was often an absent father. He divorced his wife in 1869. Two months later, he married Catherine Lyon, who was 30 years younger than Eber. She was a beauty queen. Eventually, uh, Catherine and Eber would have two additional children, but Catherine was, in some cases, the same age as some of Eber's older children, uh, and they clashed. By 1869, Eber was really at the height of a lot of his activities, um, but he suffered a stroke uh, when he was 58 years old. He was able to recover pretty quickly, like within a month uh, or so, uh, and his business has continued, and he was this major employer, but then um, uh, an economic depression called the, called the Panic of 1873 uh, hit the country, and it really caused a lot of stress. On the left, we see an, um, a letter that Eber wrote to his sister, Emily. I was reading this uh, and, um, uh, and I was deciphering it. When you start to read, this was from the Detroit Public Library. And when you read handwriting from the 1800s, it can kind of, your eyes kind of gloss over a little bit in that. But uh, I started to read it and I was like, okay, he's writing to Emily and he's saying that he's a little bit stressed out. He's, he's okay, but, but he just can't sleep. And then I looked at the date. He wrote this letter January 2nd, 1875. I was like, holy cow, because he wrote this letter, ended up going to a court hearing, and later that day, he suffered a stroke and he died. So one of the last things that Eber Ward did was he wrote this letter to his sister. Um, uh, and so when I saw this, uh, um, uh, it was just amazing to be able to see this, this uh, important um, uh, piece of, of history. After Eber's death, well, there was a big fight 
over his estate. His estate was valued at over $5 million. And a uh, conflict developed between Eber's children from his first marriage and his second wife, Catherine. Uh, and Eber was actually accused uh, by some of the, his children from his first marriage of um, being controlled by spirituals uh, because um, Eber often attended seances and was, in, and, uh, was uh, uh, caught up in a spiritualist movement uh, that went through the country in the 1840s and 50s. It was a really popular movement in the U.S. Uh, where people would go to seances and they would try to converse with people who had died. This became particularly popular after the devastation of, of the Civil War and large numbers of deaths. Um, but lots of people were involved with the spiritualism. Mary Todd Lincoln held seances at the White House. Harriet Beecher Stowe and many others were engaged in spiritualism. Eventually, um, Eber's heirs settled out of court, but Catherine received the bulk of uh, his estate and the best par parts of his properties. But she had a plan for that property. She had a daughter named Clara. Clara um, uh, was a beautiful young woman. She was only two years old when her father died, but when she became a teenager in that, she was a beautiful young woman and her mother wanted her to marry royalty. After she had uh, gone to some finishing schools, she'd been kicked out of a few, but she uh, went to some finishing schools in Europe. She ended up meeting and marrying Prince Joseph from Belgium. Uh, the two of them had a wonderful, like a wonderful wedding. It was uh, very exciting. She was one of many dollar princesses uh, as some Americans who had money, who were interested in, in gaining a title. Uh, were, um, became involved in, in this movement in the United States in like in the 1890s uh, and early 1900s. This Belgian prince provided the title and she provided the money. In her case, about $300,000 to improve the family's castle. Uh, the initial years of their marriage were quite happy, but Clara caused a sensation. Um, and, and you know uh, she reveled in this, this um, uh, attention and people liked the fact uh, that she flouted traditions. But following the birth of two children, um, Clara began having affairs with, uh, several, reportedly from, with several men. Uh, one um, rumor at the very least was, was true. And after um, uh, Clara uh, supposedly was getting attentions from the King of Belgium, the Queen of Belgium wasn't very happy. She, she wanted them to leave. And so they began spending more time in Paris where Clara met a violinist from Hungary named Rigo. She left her prince and ended up marrying a gypsy fiddler. And the press that initially loved uh, Clara began to criticize her uh, in as many ways as possible. Uh, on the right, you see a headline from the Luddington record where uh, you know it's gone with a gypsy, uh, this princess elopes uh, and she's described as uh, ruining her life. The Wyandotte Herald declared that Clara Ward was a shameless daughter of Michigan. Um, the New York Journal and Advertiser declared, no individual has done more to injure the reputation of Americans abroad than Clara Ward. She used her fame at times to became, become involved in a range of performances. The one in the middle shown there, she uh, identifies her in a bodysuit that uh, simulated nudity, and she would hold these performances where she was scantily clad, uh, and they were actually shut down in some areas because it was so controversial. I was lucky enough uh, to have a really cool trip to Belgium, and I met the current princess, and I asked her, well, what, what did you think of Clara? And she said, well, we didn't appreciate her. She didn't behave well. She also, she admitted that she was very pretty, but she also described her as fast. And I was there um, uh, and in Belgium, they speak um, uh, French primarily. And I was kind of wondering what she meant by fast. And I looked to the person who was guiding us there and I was like, does fast in, in Europe and in, in Belgium mean the same as it does in the United States? And apparently yes. Uh, and so she was highly critical of Clara, didn't want to talk much about her. <laughs> 
Well, um, Eber's legacy, and I know I'm running out of time, so I apologize going a little bit over here, uh, but Eber's legacy was, is, has largely been forgotten. On the right, we see the family plot at Detroit's Elmwood Cemetery. Cemetery. Um, he engaged in harsh business practices, uh, like the one with James Luddington. Uh, he had few close associates. He had some, but he had few. Uh, and he often was at odds with many of his employees. At that trial, Ward was portrayed as someone who was controlled by spiritualists. Uh, and so people began to dismiss him. Uh, and uh, Catherine, uh, re Catherine's actions to get uh, uh, access to and, and to control the, uh, his money um, after Ward's death really split the family. And so the family took its energies. Instead of promoting uh, Eber's uh, great accomplishments, uh, they, they schemed against one another and, and they, they, uh, it was Catherine against the other members of the family. And then finally, Pl Princess Clara's uh, activities really overshadowed the accomplishments of Eber. So how do we evaluate this guy? Uh, how do we, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we go back to this idea here of, of Eber and this, this painting. Um, well, he was a horrible husband. He was a horrible father. He was engaged in affairs. He divorced his wife of 30 some years in order to marry a beauty queen. He was ruthless with his tactics. While his actions warrant criticism, he also contributed positively to the nation in many ways. He was generous with his philanthropy and he, as he took pride in, in Newport Academy. He was a virulent opponent of slavery, which was the key moral issue of his lifetime. He even helped slaves escape. The diversity of his empire was really unique. By, by the time he, he, of his death, he was the president of nine different companies. He should be recognized as a true visionary and an industrial titan. Um, uh, and, and there was an article uh, that came out shortly after his death. Uh, and, um, and it said that Eber Brock Ward stands out as a pioneer in four of the greatest fields of industrial activity, water and rail transportation, lumber, and the manufacture of steel and iron. He was a genius that deserves to be ranked as one of the real builders of America. Before I end and take some questions, I did want to point some things out. For more information about West Shore's Humankind program, we do have a website. Uh, and if you were to Google humankind, uh, wscc.org, you'd be able to find this. We have a range of topics. Renee mentioned some a little while ago. Uh, we've got some lectures, panels. There's even some art exhibits. Our next event is September 29th at seven, uh, seven o'clock. It's also uh, via Zoom. And West Shore's Performing Arts Series is returning. And I wanted to, um, uh, you know, if you want to find more information out about some of the events, we've got plays, we've got music, uh, and then our kickoff event is coming up September 30th. It's at the Manistee Ramsdale Theater. If you've never been to an event at the Ramsdale, it's a wonderful venue. Um, and it's the Cirque Esprit. I think that's the pr correct pronunciation. Uh, but anyway, um, I just wanted to make sure to promote these other uh, uh, events. So thank you so much. Uh, I wonder if we have any questions. I'm sorry I went over. It's hard to get, stop me after I, when I start talking about Eber Ward. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. It was so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so how's you, the chat? Do you want to turn off the screen sharing? Oh yeah, sure. I'll do that. Thanks. Um, so we had a question from, um, from Monique. She said, so interesting. What were the roots of Ward's anti-slavery attitudes? Were they religiously informed or were they influenced by his sister? Yeah. So um, Eber's father traveled to Kentucky early on, uh, even before Eber's birth. Uh, and that, and so his father was so struck and so frustrated um, uh, with slavery that there's there's a letter that he wrote uh, to one of his um, uh, to one of his um, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, and he just is highly critical of Southerners and slaveholders in general. And he does so uh, from a moral perspective, from a religious perspective. Eber Sr.'s father was a, was a minister. Um, and so he was very religious. Eber Brockward, not as much as his dad, uh, but, um, uh, but very much so. I think he, he got it from his father and he believed mm -hmm. a true moral evil. Very interesting. 
Um, we had a question earlier from Carmelita. Um, are any of Eber Ward's descendants living in the area? Um, I am not of in, aware of any of his descendants that are living in the area. Okay. What I can say is that I did a presentation maybe a year ago or two years ago, something like that. And, um, uh, and in the introduction, it said it mentioned that I was working on Eber Ward. Out of the blue, I received an email from members of, of one of his descendants that, and they live in Arizona. And we've had a wonderful correspondence and they've helped me with a range of things. And so I'm so excited for them. Oh, wow. And I, I have a feeling, uh, you know, they were maybe, Diane was maybe gonna be um, on this, this uh, presentation. I don't know if she was able to make it or not. Oh, fantastic. But I'm, I'm, I'm really excited uh, that uh, we can have that connection. That's so exciting. That must oh. really... Here we are. Yeah. So uh, Eber is my five great grandfather through my father's side, uh, through his son, John P. Ward. Yeah. So that's um, uh, somebody else. Okay. Yeah. Some oh, of the relative. Was, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, oh, can you repeat why James Ludington was thrown in jail and for how long? Sure. Okay. So what happened? We want to know that, all the dirt about our, yeah, 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 <laughs> about yeah. the guy our town was named after. <laughs> so, um, so. James Ludington had a crew, a timber crew that would cut down trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were supposed to only cut down the trees on James Ludington's property. Well, either purposefully or accidentally, we don't know this for sure, uh, they, they trespassed onto Eber Ward's property, cut down some of his trees, stole some of that, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and Eber Ward found out about it. But he waited to have him arrested until Ludington came to the city of Detroit. Uh, because that was Detroit was Eber Ward's town. Um, oh, okay. And so um, he was in jail. I don't know exactly how long, but I don't think, you know, maybe a month, maybe even, you know, a couple weeks. Uh, wow. uh, so um, it wasn't for a long time because once he was in jail and he realized that he was kind of up against the wall, um, uh, he suddenly changed his mind <laughs> uh, and had agreed to uh, sell Ward that property. Uh, by the way, if I could just kind of mention one other thing with um, Eber Ward's descendants. Sure. I, tra I traveled to Ohio uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I went to an area called Ward's Canal. It's near Toledo. Uh, Ward um, operated in Ohio as well. I I've hardly touched on, on his range of activities. <laughs> you have so many places to go to. <laughs> he had, he had um, a, a, a canal dug through a marsh in order to transport um, uh, a lot of timber. Well, at the bottom of the historical marker, it said it was funded by some of Eber Ward's descendants. I would love, if somebody's out there, I would love to be in contact with you uh, to, to get in contact with another of Eber Ward's descendants. Okay, we're, we're sending the message out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a question from Jessica. How does Ward compare to Andrew Carnegie? Yeah. Or Carnegie, okay. I never know how to say that. <laughs> yeah, well, what I was, I, I called him, him Carnegie. Uh, and then um, the chair of the history department said, always said Carnegie. And oh, I don't well. know if I get it right all the time, but <laughs> anyway. So Carnegie was a much bigger figure with iron and steel production. He, he was bigger than Ward, but he was also about 20 years older or later. Um, the reason why I like to compare him, uh, you know, Ward to Carnegie is that Ward was doing some of the things that Carnegie was, is famous for, the vertical integration of you know the iron ore uh, on his ships, um, and then and then having the um, iron and steel production, and you know having that vertical integration. Mm -hmm. Ward was doing that twenty years or so uh, before Carnegie, maybe even twenty five years. Wow. Um, and Carnegie is the one uh, who's given credit for popularizing that. Uh, yet um, Ward was doing it much much earlier. So that's that's a, um and and the Chicago mill, the steel mill that that. Um, Award had that eventually would become one of the core facilities for U.S. steel, uh, oh, and, wow. then, and, Car and eventually and Carnegie's holdings and then U.S. steel. Wow. Um, another question: Did Eber Ward ever run for political office? No, he never ran for political office. But uh, during or immediately after the Civil War, um, he was this close uh, <laughs> to becoming the Treasury Secretary, probably. Um, oh, of the so, United States. Right. Yes. Oh, wow. So, so Andrew Johnson was the president at the time. He took over after Abraham Lincoln's death and um, Johnson was impeached. Well, there was a trial 
to see if he was actually going to be removed from office or not. Um, and the person who would have become president uh, if Johnson had been removed was very close to Eber Ward. Uh, and um, he had kind of outlined, he thought that he, that he was going to become president. So he ended up uh, uh, outlining um, members of his cabinet and the treasury secretary uh, was going to be Eber Ward. But uh, Johnson uh, was not kicked out of office. Uh, and so Ward never became the treasury secretary. Oh, well, so close. Yeah. <laughs> We have some others. Any other questions? I hope oh, I wasn't okay. talking too fast. No, no. Um, could you speak more about the seances? Oh, the seances. Okay, all right. So, so was there like I kind of a follow up to that? Was there a specific person that he wanted to contact, or like reason he was interested in that? Do you think? Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, a range of things. Just one thing with the seances. Um, different people have tried to determine how popular uh, spiritualism was, you know, several hundred thousand Americans. One author says as many as 11 million Americans, <laughs> of a population of 25 million, and most think that's like a little bit too high, but yeah. it was really very popular. Um, and, and for some, just as a form of entertainment, mm -hmm. okay, um, but Ward was probably influenced as a, as a, you know, uh, as a form of entertainment, but supposedly he would go to these seances and try to um, interact with his former wife because his mm -hmm. wife died, uh, his, his first wife died shortly after the divorce. Uh, oh. And, um, and he was asking her if it was, okay, you know, what he should do, uh, things oh. like that. And, and his opponents, um, uh, his critics said he was seeking um, advice, uh, like business advice uh, from people. Uh, you know, I discount uh, his heavy influence. You know, I, I think that he went to these seances uh, and he found it kind of amusing, but I don't think he was actively seeking advice and making business decisions uh, based upon things on the Ouija board. You know, right, for example, right. or the spirit wrappings um, that were really popular at the time. So, but it it was something that was pretty widespread nationwide um, in the mid 1800s, and particularly uh, immediately after the Civil War, um, in many communities. Oh, let's see. Did his first wife want alimony? Was alimony a thing? Um, so, uh, okay. So I'm trying to think of exactly how much she got. Yes, um, there were terms of the divorce. And mm -hmm. I think that she was supposed to get like $5,000 or $6,000 a year. I can't remember for sure how much, but it, it was it was a lot. But compared to his assets and, and his and his empire, it, it wasn't very much. So it was far more than what an average person would have had per year. Uh, but yeah. it was, it was, it wasn't, his empire wasn't divided 50-50 uh, <laughs> by any means at all. So, yeah. Did we have any other questions? No other, oh, um, yeah, thank you, Monique, for all the questions. Um, what was the most important influence re researching this book had on you? Most important influence? Well, okay, so um, one of the things that I learned, I guess you could say, is that um, running a business is really a lot of work, and there's an awful lot of pressures and it's easy to point your finger at the person at the top, whether it's, whether it's um, a community college um, that's being <laughs> operated by someone, okay, or um, the president of the United States, mm -hmm. or um, the leader of, of a business. And so it's, um, there, you, you have to have tremendous drive um, and skill, but it's an awful lot of pressure as well. And so, so that's one thing, you know, I guess, 
-hmm. I mean, it was, you know, I, I get my history nerd out, you know, uh, uh, when I get to go on some of these trips and I, sure. I, I get to look through archival material. I've got to tell you, you know, I was reading these letters and just being like, whoa, gosh, and trying to transcribe them. And then I read the one that he wrote right before he died. And I mean, that just made my day. It didn't, oh, actually, I bet. It didn't make my day. It made my week. I, it was, <laughs> it was uh, pretty amazing um, uh, for that. So, so it's, you know, another thing, I guess, is that you just have to keep on trucking and keep on moving and um, uh, doing your best to try to complete the research, I guess. I, yeah, I hope that answers yeah. the question. Okay, and uh, last question, where can we pre-order your new book? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, you, because it's, it's a, so, so it's not even in the warehouse or anything yet, uh, I still have a lot of work <laughs> to do on it. So I finished the manuscript and it's gone through like um, uh, several hoops. The, mm -hmm. the next thing, so you can't is the, is the quick answer to the question. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, you know, another thing that I learned in this process is that it takes a long time. So I finished quote unquote, finished the book, let's just say last March, something like that, mm -hmm. sent it to the publisher, and then it needs to go through the reviewers. Then they rip it apart, uh, and say it's bad here. It's bad here. It's bad here, but overall it's great. You can make these changes. <laughs> and so, sure. uh, so I then sent it, um, I did all these changes. Uh, I was able to do that by set early. Um, uh, sometime in August. And now, you know, um, um, there's a copy editor who's going to rip it apart uh, Great, and then more. give it to me. Yeah. And then I make some changes there. Um, and then I go to, um, uh, then I'll have to do things like the index uh, and make sure the images are all set. So, you know. All these um, things you don't think of about writing a book. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> One thing that I can say is if anyone is interested in the Justice Stearns book, it did come out in paperback just this September. So it's a little bit cheaper. Okay. Uh, uh, and so uh, you would go to Wayne State University Press. If, if you went to their webpage, um, you could then just type in Stearns um, and you could get access to that book. Um, but um, it's, it's a little bit less expensive. So, so that's kind of <laughs> nice. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and put the um, survey in the chat here so that everybody can um, hopefully provide feedback for us on how you enjoyed this event tonight. Um, and don't forget, you can find all of our upcoming Humankind events on the website um, and on the Facebook page, and there's a bunch of different ways to get in touch with us. So I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight, and thank you so much, Mike. It was fantastic. Well, I really appreciate it. I think we had about 65 people or something like that. It looked yeah, like. Yeah. The, uh, and, and so I just appreciate you taking your time on a Thursday evening. And if, and if people could please complete that survey, especially students, but not just students, <laughs> yep. but we would love to get your feedback. How can we improve? Um, what did you think of this? Um, and um, uh, anything that you can help and uh, stay tuned for next week uh, yeah. as we get our next event. And don't forget about the cultural art series. Uh, here at West Shore. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful right. night. Okay. Thanks, everybody.